Hey everyone, um, my name is Suraj and today I'm going to be speaking about how we can make our AI workloads more efficient with PyTorch. So um, I'm, a, I'm an ML developer advocate at Meta AI and before this I used to work as a data scientist in healthcare and finance. And that's where I started using deep learning models and PyTorch and I got acquainted with the framework and I really like how easy it is for non-programmers or uh, people who aren't as well versed with the uh, nitty gritties of deep learning to be also able to use PyTorch. I also tweet at uh, Subraman, that's my Twitter handle. So follow me there if you'd like to um, stay in touch or uh, ask me any questions about your PyTorch usage. So in today's talk, um, it's a pretty simple one and the agenda is pretty small. Uh, first, we're going to just be talking about how AI needs to be efficient and what's the current state. Um, then we'll touch upon what are some of the bottlenecks in training your models and also inference. And we'll all, along the way, we'll also be covering certain techniques in PyTorch that help you optimize your training and inference code. So um, it's, it's no secret that um, bigger the sorry uh, we'd probably need to snip that up so um, the best models at the moment are some of the largest ones around and this feels uh, like a pretty natural progression because as a task gains in complexity there is a lot more data that you need to compress all of that information and to hold all of that compressed information and to be able to generalize that to different use cases, you also need a lot of parameters. So uh, in this plot, you can see that um, the BERT or the transformer revolution started somewhere at the uh, million mark, the 100 million mark. BERT had around 200, 300 million uh, parameters. And GPT-2 had 1.5, and its successor, GPT-3, had 175 billion parameters. I would not be surprised if GPT-4 uh, has or touches uh, close to trillion parameters. And the more the complicated the task gets, the more parameters you need. And this is, a, this is from a recent study that was published in the uh, ACM conference uh, a few months back. And what stands out to me in this graph is that the carbon emissions from training a 6 billion transformer model is equivalent to the average US household's energy consumption throughout a year. The, the kicker is that they didn't even train the entire model. Uh, they stopped very early at about 13% of the entire training, um, training cycle. So the, a partially trained model consumes more energy than an average US household. Data science is painfully empirical and so much of our work is iterating through architectures and hyperparameters to find that right combination of data and learning algorithms. And these training runs, even though they're evaluating um, the right architecture, cross-validating different hyperparameters, they add up. They add up real quick. And the cost of training a model gets inflated because of these um, cross-validation runs. For example, this headline, uh, it grabbed all of our attention a few years back. And it's not about GPT-3 or any other billion scale model. It's referring to the very humble bird, which has around less than 300 million parameters. All of their extra compute, equivalent to five cars in their entire lifetimes, all that extra compute has been attributed to the neural architecture search. And training, it's only half the story, or even less than half, really, because the cost to train the model is usually a one-time cost. And as machine learning starts to become more ubiquitous, the real compute costs are going to be incurred at inference time. In this graph, uh, it shows how increasing compute requirements for inference are driving up power consumption. And 
this only shows data from Meta's data centers, but this trend is likely to be replicated as more applications and more companies go machine learning first. When training jobs run longer, they get more expensive. And they are costly not only for the power drawn and carbon emitted, but also for the bill your cloud provider sends you. So a first step towards more efficient and cost-effective training is to make sure that we are optimizing them and eliminating the bottlenecks that we can. But before we get to the optimizations, let's understand what the most typical bottlenecks here are. The most obvious one is the compute cost. Uh, this is the time and energy your chip takes to execute operations on your tensors. This is mostly difficult to optimize outside of changing the actual operation you're running. And uh, for this reason, it is best tackled by hardware software co-design. For example, TPUs and NVIDIA's newer GPUs, which use tensor cores. Uh, they are highly optimized for operations like mat mulls and convolutions that are most typical in deep networks. The more important bottleneck for us is memory bandwidth. Um, this this is the time that it this is the time it takes to move tensors around a GPU and get them ready for an operation. And this is the critical cost that slows us down. Like GPUs spend more time doing memory access than the actual operation itself. For instance, the fastest uh, NVIDIA GPU, the A100s uh, today, uh, they have a bandwidth of 2 terabytes per second. Uh, that means it can load in about 400 billion numbers per second. But in that same time, the GPU can perform 20 trillion operations. So in one second, the GPU can perform 20 trillion operations, but it is bottlenecked because it can only load 400 billion numbers for those 20 trillion operations. That's, that's a multiple of 50. Another way to understand this problem is by way of a nice analogy by my colleague, Horace. By the way, you should read this blog that I have linked here. Uh, it's a very informative and entertaining read about optimizing uh, deep learning runs. So in this analogy, it helps to think of compute as a factory that receives raw materials and operates on them. In this case, the raw materials are tensors, and they are stored in a DRAM warehouse on the other end of the GPU. Your factory workers might be the best, most efficient, highly skilled chaps on the assembly line. But it doesn't mean much if the trucks transporting the raw materials are too slow. So now, realistically, upgrading the GPU bus width, it's not a plausible solution. So we work with what we have and just stuff that bus. We just cram that with tensors. A few years back, researchers realized that if we can compress our tensors, we can cram more of them on the GPU bus, and our compute is going to be more occupied. And an excellent side effect to this is that compute can run an excellent side effect is that compute can run faster on smaller tensors. So if we compress them enough, uh, we can send more of them for pre-processing, and the processing itself is going to be faster. So the way tensors are compressed is by lowering their precision. Deep learning frameworks usually default to using 32-bit floating point numbers. And this is the representation at the top on the image. This data type uses 23 bits of precision. That is, you can represent numbers as large as 10 to the power 38. And that's an extremely large number. Deep networks don't need that kind of precision to work as well as they do. So you have smaller data types that chip manufacturers build optimized kernels for. Since they are smaller, almost half the size, uh, being 16 bits, you can cram up to twice these numbers on a GPU bus. And because compute is so much faster than memory loading, 
PyTorch doesn't need to run the compute in low precision math at all. The entire 2x speed up comes from effectively doubling our memory bandwidth just by using half precision tensors. So for most deep learning needs, floating point 32 is on its way out. If you're training in full precision, you're leaving a lot of money, compute, and potential energy savings on the table. So wherever possible, you should use mixed precision training. And PyTorch makes this very simple to use with a single function call. <clears throat> the reason this is called mixed precision is because parts of the training process, such as the forward and backward pass, are done in half precision. And because the weight update is a critical step, the optimizer states and a master copy of the weights are maintained in full precision. So using this technique, you drop precision where it doesn't matter and keep precision where it matters. And the API simplifies all of this for us. It automatically detects which operations should be run in half or full precision. All you need to do is enable torch.autocast on your forward pass. On to some more cutting edge stuff. <clears throat> this research was published a few months back in ICLR. Here, uh, they take it a step, a few steps further, I think. <laughs> Even the optimizer is now dropped to 8-bit or integer precision. This is pretty exciting stuff. Um, they show big savings in memory and training time with barely noticeable changes to accuracy. And the code is open sourced in this repository linked here. And the authors say it's a two line drop and replacement for your PyTorch training jobs. That makes it really simple to integrate with existing training code. I definitely recommend checking it out and trying it out because the savings in time and memory are, they, they look pretty amazing. So far, we've seen that currently the easiest way to reduce the memory bandwidth and compute costs is to use low precision numbers. We also saw how simple it is to integrate that into existing PyTorch code. So really, there is no reason to continue training in FP32 uh, unless you're working in a very specialized use case. And if you haven't already, you should check, check if your models run equally well in half precision. There is one more bottleneck that hampers training time. And generally, overhead means any activity that your code is doing that is A, not moving tensors around, or B, not actually running operations on them. So everything else can be lumped into the overhead. And there are a few different overheads at play here. Uh, when you launch your training job, the first overhead encountered is from the Python interpreter that is compiling your code. Next, a PyTorch module like nn.linear actually makes many calls and dispatches under the hood before the addmm operation takes place. So there is the overhead arising from the PyTorch framework itself. And finally, when we do reach the kernel, before we can start executing on the GPU, there are many overhead costs that need to be paid at the CPU. So we're going to be taking a look at this last overhead. In the image, you can see that um, the, upper, the upper profile uh, pertains to the CPU, or basically the CPU launch kernel. And the little boxes in the lower part of the image are the actual GPU kernels executing. And notice that there is a big gap between two consecutive GPU kernels. In that gap, the GPU is idle. And if it is idle, it is wasted. So what we would like to do is reduce the CPU overhead so that GPU kernels can keep executing asynchronously. So PyTorch 1.10 has a new feature called CUDA graphs. So this figure explains very succinctly what is going on. 
before executing the training code, we trace all of the operations to be done and capture it in a graph. So that is denoted by this lower half over here. In the upper half of the image, you have your non-CUDA graph execution. And it looks similar to the image we saw in the previous slide. In the lower half, uh, we are tracing the code. Uh, all of all, all the code that needs to be run, basically all the kernels or operations that are going to be executed are traced into a static graph. And this includes information like which kernels need to be launched, uh, what are the memory locations that they're going to need access to. And all of this information is frozen in a static graph. So doing this eliminates the need to relaunch these kernels with new arguments each time it is called. And as you can see in the figure, the launch overhead is incurred only once. This eliminates a lot of the CPU overhead associated with launching CUDA kernels. While this is not a drop-in code replacement, it is fairly simple to include in your training job. And the process that I spoke about looks a little clearer in code. We first start with creating an empty graph over here. And we have already initialized two tensors, static input and static target. These will be the fixed memory locations that our graph kernels are going to access. So the graph then captures the operations what that we want to run in torch.qr.graph. The model will run a forward pass on the tensor in the fixed memory location given by static input. This output is then captured into another fixed memory location denoted by the tensor static y pred. And static y pred is compared with the tensor at static target. And this loss is then back, back propagated. At runtime, we populate the static input and static target tensors with new data at each iteration. For our kernels, nothing changes. They are still reading and writing to the same memory locations. So there is no need to relaunch kernels. And performance has significantly improved using CUDA graphs uh, during training for a recommender system over here. Note that the speed up starts to flatten around an overall batch size of 65,000, meaning at that point, we are no longer overhead bound. Prior to that, uh, there are speed ups on the multiples of 2, 2.5, um, pretty significant. So we took a look at all of the bottlenecks uh, that hamper our training time. Uh, we saw compute and memory bandwidth costs can be reduced by just lowering the size of your tensors. And overheads can also be alleviated by using CUDA graphs or tracing your code so that all of the execution is frozen statically and we don't need to uh, relaunch kernels uh, every time they're called. Uh, now for inference time, uh, we, might, we might not have time to go too deep into detail over here, but the same first principles hold true here. So model compression, like pruning and distillation, they again help to alleviate the compute and memory bandwidth costs. The nice thing about over-parameterized networks is that they are generally easier to compress because they can encode a lot of information redundantly across their many parameters. So if we drop some of them out, the model is still fairly accurate. And this is exactly what model pruning does. And of course, there is quantization, which drops the precision of our model from FP32 to 8-bit integers. Typically, doing this provides speed ups of two to six times. Based on research in the space, here's a workflow that helps you identify the most suitable quantization scheme for your, for your models. Each scheme has its own trade offs to consider, and different model architectures perform differently uh, on different schemes. The linked GitHub repository contains a notebook that it contains a notebook with uh, step-by-step walkthroughs of 
implementing this workflow along with other examples in quantization. At inference time, we also encounter overheads relating to kernel launches. And here again, tracing with CUDA graphs helps alleviate a lot of the CPU launch overheads. This plot shows uh, the effect of using CUDA graphs on an inference workload, again, on the same kind of model architecture. Uh, as you can see, they're pretty effective in speeding up inferences and improving throughput on a large DL recommender model. There is also a recent API from PyTorch that is a drop-in replacement for torch.nograd. So the speedups from this are not going to be as mind-blowing as using CUDA graphs, but it is trivially simple to have in your code. Just wrap the model's forward pass in torch.inference mode. This speeds up code by eliminating some overheads in the PyTorch framework that are not needed for inference. Uh, so thank you for listening. I hope this talk helped you. I have covered some of the simplest optimization techniques that you can use in your PyTorch code. There are more techniques, operator fusion, for instance, that help speed things up a bit more, but they are also a bit more complicated to implement. However, at PyTorch, our engineers are working very hard to make these techniques more easily accessible and more available. Um, and provide more tools to make your AI run efficiently.